use the term residue to refer to what used to be an amino acid when it's in the context of a protein. Here's why and why it matters. There are 20 common unique amino acids or these protein building blocks or letters. And each of these has a generic backbone as well as a unique side chain or R group that sticks off of those backbones. The backbone is where these amino acids get their, their name from. They have an amino group at one end, so there's nitrogen surrounded by hydrogens, and a carboxyl group at the other end. And so basically this carboxyl group at a higher pH is going to be deprotonated and it's going to be in its carboxylate state, um, but at the lower pH you're going to have it in this carboxylic acid form. Although it's typically in its deprotonated state, um, in this carboxylic state, it gets the name amino acid because of this carboxylic acid form, but these are readily interchangeable just depending on the pH. So together we have an amino group and a carboxyl or a carboxylic acid group, and then this gives the name amino acid. What happens when these amino acids link together is they do so using the amino group of one amino acid and the carboxyl group of another amino acid. They do this by losing the equivalent of water to form a peptide bond, which is a type of amide bond. What you'll see here is that you've lost that carboxylic acid group. And so now we can't really call these amino acids. Instead, we need a different word for them. And so we refer to them as residues because of the residuals or like the leftovers of those amino acids. And they still have those unique side chains or R groups that stick off. So for example, if this was an alanine amino acid and this was, if we had an alanine amino acid and a glycine amino acid and they joined together, we would still have the side chains of the alanine and of the glycine in, when they're connected through this peptide bond. And so we would still be able to refer to these but to their side chains, but we would call this an alanine residue and a glycine residue. And we could do this for each of the different amino acids that we link together. So each of these would be individual residues. Now, this is important because those individual residues have different side chains, and those side chains have different properties that are going to influence how the protein folds. But it's also important in the, that in the context of a protein, these amino acid residues are going to act differently than the free-floating amino acids. The surrounding context of the amino acid residue of that side chain that's sticking off of the protein is going to be differently reactive often than that side chain of the amino acid when it's just free floating. A common example of this is with nucleophilic amino acids. So much more on what this means in other posts, but basically nucleophilicity is one way in which molecules can react with one another and much more in this in other posts. But some of these amino acids that are nucleophilic include like serine and threonine and cysteine and tyrosine and lysine and histidine. What these have in common is that they're in their nucleophilic, they're like a tacky state when they're in their deprotonated form. And their protonation state depends on the pH um, because at a lower pH, you're going to have fewer pro more protons available. At a higher pH, you're going to have fewer protons available. And so when we want, need there to be fewer protons available, which means we need to get to a high pH often in order to get these to deprotonate. So for example, a serine, you'd have to get to a pH of about 13 for half of it to be deprotonated if we're just talking about serine in its free-floating form. So that seems really, really unlikely. However, we have these powerful proteins called serine proteases that actually use serine, deprotonated serine, in order to cut up peptides or cut up proteins. And so how are they able to do it? Well, one way that they're able to do it is that in the context of the surrounding protein, these residues are going to have like as lower local P, um, pH or a higher local pH, they're going to be have a lower pKa, they're going to be able to deprotonate more easily. And since they're able to be more deprotonate more easily, they're going to be more reactive. So here, the serine residue is going to have a much different property than the free-floating serine. And the residue in another protein where it was had a different context would have a different property as well. So the surrounding property, the surround the surrounding environment of that residue is going to be really important. And it's important that we remember that it's a residue and not just a free-floating amino acid.
So although it just might, might seem like just a pedantic term um, to refer to it as a residue rather than an amino acid, and often we do just refer to these as amino acids, it is important to remember that they really are residues. Another common example of this is lysine. Lysine also needs to be deprotonated to be active. Um, and But lysine as a nucleophile can do important things like let like hook up to acetyl-CoA to form these important intermediates and things like this. And um, so lysine is going to be able to do this when it's in the deprotonated state, but lysine has a high pKa again. But again, when it's in the context of a surrounding protein, this lysine can be activated. And so the residue, um, remembering it's a residue, is going to help you remember that these amino acids in the context of a protein can be more active, even though you might not expect them to based on just their pKa. Speaking of that pKa, if we look at, so the pKa is basically the pH at which half of a molecule is going to be deprotonated and half of it is going to be protonated. And so at uh, the higher the pKa, the less likely it's going to be to actually deprotonate. And the lower the pKa, the more likely it's going to be to deprotonate or um, it will be deprotonated at like a, um, at a lower pH. And so when we look at the amino acid, remember the name comes from the amino group in the carboxylic acid group. However, what happens is that if you're at a high enough pH that you get this amino group deprotonated, you're also going to have the carboxylic acid group deprotonated. And if you get to a low enough pH that you have the amino acid, that you have the amino group protonated, or that you have the carboxylic acid group protonated, you're also going to have the amino group protonated. And so although we often refer to it in, we of, it's often drawn in this kind of like non-ionic form, where you have this deprotonated amino group in this protonated carboxylic acid group, um, this is really not physiologically relevant. And so instead, what we deal with is this witter ionic form where you have this be protonated and this be deprotonated. However, you've commonly seen it drawn like this, and this helps you remember where it's the name amino acid from that has this amino group and this carboxylic acid group. But all of that is kind of a moot point. When you combine them into these through these peptide bonds, now you're only going to have a free amino group at one end and a free carboxyl group at the other end. And the remainders are going to be these residues, which are going to have properties that are distinct from the properties of the, the free floating amino acid forms. One last note is that if we have these amino acids all joined up through these peptide bonds, it's really, it gets really unwieldy to call them by their full names when you have a whole string of them. So instead, we typically refer to them by either their three-letter or their one-letter codes. I highly recommend that you memorize these three-letter and one-letter codes and also memorize just like how to recognize the amino acids. It's great if you can memorize how to draw them, but at least be able to recognize them and know their basic properties. But you really, really, really should know their abbreviations. These abbreviations are used a lot, especially in things like um, biochemistry and structural biology. When we're trying to, we're referring to a whole string of amino acid residues, we want to be able to talk about them in quicker notation than writing out the whole thing. And so the one-letter abbreviations come in really handy. A lot of them are really um, self-explanatory, or like leucine would be an L. Some of them are a little weirder, um, like lysine being a K. Um, but so you just have to remember some of those special exceptions. One other shorthand thing that you might see is that we refer to these like their position um, and their letter. So if we had an alanine in the 91th position, we would call that 91A. And if that alanine was changed from a glycine, we could call that G91A. And so that's just one of the ways that we refer to these amino acid residues. And so remember that a residue is just a name for the leftovers of an amino acid when it's in the context of a protein. So if we had a cysteine and we had an alanine link up through a peptide bond, we would refer to a cysteine residue and an alanine residue. And we could do this for all of the different amino acids, and each of these would be a different residue within the context of the larger protein. And those residues might have different properties than the free-floating amino acid forms.
But remember that a lot of the times when you're seeing properties written for things like PKA, for various amino acids, that's typically for their free floating form. Um, and so remember that in the context of the protein, those PKA, that sort of thing, those are likely going to be different and this can allow proteins to be more reactive. So hope that helped you understand residues and why, why the term can actually matter to help you remember that these are different.